Welcome to tonight's program. Uh, I'm Clarence Lang, Acting Director of the Hall Center, which is uh, organized this event in collaboration with the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and the European Studies Program of the Center for Global and International Studies. It's my honor to welcome you all here tonight. This event is part of an ongoing series of activities at the University of Kansas that commemorate the centennial of the Civil, of, no, I was gonna say the Civil War, the Great War, otherwise known as World War I. You can see where my head is, so thank you. Uh, in that spirit, uh, it is our great pleasure this evening to bring you Joshua Sanborn, uh, who's professor of history at Lafayette College, an expert in Russian, East European, uh, Eastern Europe and the Cold War, he is the author of several books, most recently, Imperial Apocalypse, The Great War and the Destruction of the Russian Empire, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2014. This work has been hailed as the first major study uh, to situate the demise of the Russian Empire within the context of decolonization in the 20th century. Uh, and it has been praised as well for its close attention to the individual lives of soldiers, civilians, and others who were caught in the vortex of war and revolution. Professor Sanborn's remarks will draw heavily from, from this work. The Hall Center has asked Eric Scott to introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Scott is Associate Professor of History here at the University of Kansas and a specialist in modern Russia, Eurasia, and the Soviet Union with an emphasis on migration and diaspora. Professor Scott, who earned his doctorate from the University of California, Berkeley, is the author of the book, Familiar Strangers, The Georgian Diaspora and the Evolution of Soviet Empire. He has held research fellowships at the Kennan Institute of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, as well as at the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies at Georgetown University. He also has been the recipient of grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Council of Learned Societies, among other institutions. Um, Professor Scott is not one to, uh, to let moss grow on him at, at the moment. He is at work on a new book uh, titled Illegal Immigration, Soviet Defectors, and the Borders of the Cold War World. So please help me welcome Eric Scott. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clarence, for that very kind introduction. It's not, not often that the, the introducer is, is uh, introduced, so I appreciate that. And you've already sort of done part of the work for me in, in, in introducing uh, Josh Sanborn, who uh, joins us this evening from Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. Uh, I've long been an admirer of, of uh, Dr. Sanborn's work, and I do want to thank the Hall Center uh, European Studies in the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies for, for helping bring him here tonight. When we talked uh, this past summer about bringing a speaker to campus who could both uh, carry on our series on World War I and also speak about the legacy of the Russian Revolution that occurred uh, almost exactly you know, to the day uh, 100 years ago, uh, Josh Sanborn was at the top of our list. And as you'll see, uh, in Sanborn's view, the war and the revolution are not two separate events, but are actually inter intimately intertwined and perhaps inseparable. Uh, Dr. Sanborn received his BA from Stanford University and his PhD from the University of Chicago. And uh, in this time, uh, since receiving his PhD, has really established himself as a leading scholar uh, in Russian history in European history and military history. And I think his work is really distinguished by the fact that it, it crosses uh, any neat and, and restrictive borders that we might place on regions, on phenomena, and on events. Uh, his first book, uh, which I think is available here uh, in the lobby, Drafting the Russian Nation, Military Conscription, Total War, and Mass Politics, uh, really collapses the borders between the home front and the war, and it looks at both military history and mass politics across the divide of 1917. Uh, his second book, Gender, Sex, and the Shaping of Modern Europe, a history from the French Revolution to the present day, which was co-authored with Annette Tim, 
examines gender revolution and empire across the political boundaries of Europe as a whole. And finally, his most recent book, Imperial Apocalypse, The Great War and the Destruction of Russian, the Russian Empire, which was just released in 2015 in an affordable paperback edition uh, by Oxford University Press, uh, focuses on the experience of war in Russia's western borderlands, which stretch from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. And the book is remarkable in that it uses multiple archival sources from Russia, from Latvia, from Ukraine, from the US. It creatively combines military history with the history of migration, and it reimagines Russia's experience in the First World War, as Clarence said, as a story of decolonization and, and perhaps uh, posits the Soviet Union as the world's uh, first post-colonial state. In addition to his research, uh, Dr. Sanborn is an award-winning teacher, a prominent public speaker, uh, and has served as a panelist for the History Channel. He's also uh, written numerous digital publications and is a frequent contributor to the Russian History Blog, uh, which is RussianHistoryBlog.org. Uh, I'm a big fan of this site, and currently uh, he's offering readers an anatomy of his Russian history course from syllabus construction uh, and the selection of readings to his experience in the classroom. And I think uh, one thing that holds together both his teaching and his research is that he moves between these large concepts like decolonization and the experiences of everyday people who live through historical events like the First World War. So we are thrilled to welcome him here uh, tonight at the lead center for his talk, The Great War and the Russian Revolution, a reappraisal at the centennial. Please join me in welcoming him to KU. Well, thank you. That was that was really terrific. I have to bring you guys back to uh, to Lafayette to speak to my provost. Uh, that's uh, that's that's a really great introduction. Um, thanks to both of you, and thanks to the to the Hall Center uh, and to the University at Large for inviting me here tonight. It's a real pleasure to come out and speak on what is very nearly the centennial of the Russian Revolution. Uh, what I'm going to try to do tonight is to try to link together these sort of centennial themes of. Um, uh, uh, there's been a long centennial of World War I, um, beginning in, in, in 2014, of course, and now moving into the, uh, the centennial of, of the Russian Revolution by trying to think about ways that, that we might analyze it in, uh, in new or in, in fresh ways um, um, 100 years later. So what I'm going to do is to sort of start out with a discussion of, of where, these, uh, where these centennials um, have, have, have brought us so, so far. So let me start with a discussion of the centennial of World War I, um, which, as I said, has been, has been going on for, uh, for the last three years. Um, uh, this is a picture I took. I had a group of Lafayette students um, in the fall of 2014 on a study abroad program, and this is the Menin Gate in Ypres. Um, those are all, all names of fallen soldiers. Every night they have a last post. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's quite crowded in there. This is one of the main gates into the city. In other words, in Belgium and in many places in Western Europe, um, war commemoration was alive and well in 2014 and, and remains so in many respects. There are a series of, of events that were taking place. There was a huge display of poppies at the Tower of London, um, concerts, plays, movies, um, you name it. There was a lot of commemoration going on at, at the centennial of, of the war. Uh, among scholars of the war, I think there was a great deal of anticipation uh, that the centennial might bring, um, again, some sort of some fresh ideas to the public discussion um, about the war, which had um, grown in many respects, I think, kind of, kind of stale, especially in some of the more uh, prominent countries that continue to commemorate the war, especially in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, but in many respects, um, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the, the scholarly contributions were not making, not surprisingly, not making a huge um, impact on the way the war was being commemorated uh, in, in the large European countries. So scholars in the years coming up to the war, Holger Afflerbach had a great um, collection of essays uh, uh, on whether the war was inevitable, um, and he, uh, he tried to argue for the notion that World War I's outbreak was, in fact, improbable. 
Um, so there's, uh, again, sort of a little iconoclasm going, going there. Uh, Chris Clark, a Cambridge historian, dropped a huge volume entitled Sleepwalkers Upon the Academic World, which shook things up by refocusing the war on the conflict between Austria and Serbia and relegating other states, especially Germany, further into, into the background uh, and chastising earlier um, generations of historians for focusing way too much on war guilt. So um, there, was a number, there were a number of interesting um, uh, uh, processes that were taking place within the scholarly world. But as I said, these didn't really make too much of an impact in the public um, commemoration um, of, of the war. Uh, the United States, um, with a few exceptions, most notably in this region, especially at the World War I Museum in, in Kansas City, largely ignored, <laughs> I think, the centennial in, in, in 2014. Uh, Russia had a few stray museum um, exhibits. Um, the United Kingdom put on large, ostentatious displays of mourning. And the Germans attacked one another on the front pages of prominent newspapers and paid for everyone's conferences. So this is sort of a typical kind of, 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 uh, of commemoration cycle in, in 21st century academia. Um, we're just now coming up on the centennial of the revolution. There's been, uh, uh, there's been less buildup in a certain way, I think, towards the centennial of, uh, of, the, of the 2017 revolution, in particular of the October revolu revolution um, uh, late in the year when the communists came to power. Um, but we have seen uh, an, up uh, an upsurge in, in publications, uh, uh, in books. I've got um, some examples um, uh, of those up there. Uh, but it's more difficult to identify a specific tone surrounding the centennial of the revolution. And, and this is perhaps the point. Whereas the great war commemorations engaged us in the lacrimose style, there's little tear jerking involved in remembering the Russian Revolution 100 years later. On the one hand, this is the result of a pointedly cerebral approach, which for scholars makes sense. That's kind of what we, we do for a living. But also by politicians. Um, as far as I know, so far, no major politicians outside of the former Soviet Union have commented on the centennial, uh, though that may change in a couple of weeks on November 7th. But even within Russia itself, the government has sought to downplay the anniversary, mainly by promising to leave it to historians and sponsoring a few conferences around the country. So the, people are feeling a little um, awkward, I think, about how to deal with the centennial of the Russian Revolution. And there hasn't been a whole lot of connectivity between commemorations of the war and of the revolution. So this has left some public observers, um, I think, a little baffled. Um, so I'm going to give one example here. Um, this is a piece by Ian Frazier, a staff writer for The New Yorker, who's writing here for the Smithsonian, um, who's written uh, a travelogue of his, of his travels in Russia, has been back and forth to Russia quite a bit. And one of the, this is a recent article by him, um, as you can see, entitled, What Ever Happened to the Russian Revolution? Um, and we can see in this article, I'm going to give you a couple of selections of, from it in a second, um, that when pressed to uh, uh, discuss the whys of the Russian Revolution, why did it happen, most folks slip back into patterns established decades ago. Uh, though in this instance, uh, we have the corpse of a presumably discredited Marxism-Leninism to repulse or amuse us or even just confuse us, right? I mean, what did we do with, with Marxism-Leninism sort of hanging over the revolution when it's um, sort of dead on the historical stage? Rather, it's like some cheap sequel to Weekend at Bernie's or a cheaper sequel to Weekend at Bernie's 2 or something like that. Um, so people are struggling to deal with Marxism-Leninism uh, and with revolution in the broad sense of, of the word. Um, ultimately, though, I think we have to come back to these questions at the centennial, uh, because these have been the big questions that have animated debate over the last hundred years. And the two biggest questions are communism. What, what does it mean to have the emergence of communism on the world stage? And also, more broadly, insurrection, right? a successful large-scale uh, revolt um, that, um, uh, that overturned an ancient empire and, and transformed it in, in very remarkable ways. Um, and so again, without these sort of lodestars of communism and, and, and insurrection to guide commentary, and this is true really since 1991, the public appraisals have been a bit lost. Um, with the exception, I would say, of some remaining Marxist figures um, who have rejoined old musty debates and are eagerly debating on the revolution as we speak, um, those are very much on the periphery of the debate. For non-Marxists, like Fraser, uh, the analysis is murkier. So 
Problems unsolved take their own course. The river in flood cuts an oxbow. The overfull dam gives way. The Russian Revolution started as a network of cracks that suddenly broke open in a massive rush. Drastic Russian failures had been mounting. The question of how to divide the land among the people who worked it, the inadequacy of a clumsy autocracy to deal with a fast-growing industrial society, the wretched conditions of hundreds of thousands of rural-born workers who had packed into bad housing in Petrograd and other industrial cities, to name a few. But nobody predicted the shape that the cataclysm um, might, uh, would take. So this is curious, right? We have a, a, an imminent revolution, but no revolutionaries uh, anywhere here. Like, no one knows what, what shape it's going to take. Um, you have a river, you have a dam, you have cracks. It's all curiously um, de de depersonalized here. And this becomes even more clear at the end of the essay when he tries to assess the lessons of October 100 years on. One simple lesson of the revolution might be that if a situation looks as if it can't go on, it won't. Imbalance seeks imbalance. By this logic, climate change will likely continue along the path it seems headed for. And a world in which the richest eight people control as much wealth as 3.6 billion of their global co-inhabitants, half the human race, will probably see a readjustment. The populist movements now gaining momentum around the world, however localized or distinct, may signal a big, the beginning of a bigger process. When you have a few leaders to choose from, you get sick of them eventually and want to throw them out. And when you have just one leader of ultimate importance in your whole field of vision, in Russia, the Tsar, the irritation becomes acute. So enough. Let's think about ordinary folks for a change. That was the message of Lenin's two long pants, of the Bolsheviks' leather chauffeur coats and workers' caps, and of all socialist realist paintings. But it takes a certain discipline to think about people in general. The mind craves specifics, and in time you go back to thinking about individuals. As Stalin supposedly said, one person's death is a tragedy, but the death of a million people is a statistic. Tsar Nicholas II was sainted for, not for being a martyr, for be, but for being an individual suffering person you can relate to. This is curiously unexplanatory. Um, social injustice is bad, and the economic inequality is bad, and sometimes people get sick of their leaders, and occasionally we should think about ordinary folks, but whew, that's a lot of discipline. Let's get back to talking about individuals I met in Russia, and about the Tsar, and about Stalin. We'll throw in an apocryphal quote, and we can turn to the glossy pictures. Now, I'm no fan of the Bolshevik party, but my god, they didn't deserve a fate like this. They really did change the world, and they really did leave a legacy, and I think it's incumbent upon us to try to think concretely about the ways that that um, might, uh, uh, might have happened. So I think there's plenty of space here at the Centennial, Centennial for analyzing the Russian Revolution and its impact anew, and that's what I'd like to do today by adding a term, empire, to the terms war and revolution to see if this approach might be productive. Now, this isn't the only possible pro productive approach, but it's the one I wrote a book on, so that's the one I'm going to talk about today. OK. Why do we have to bring the notion of empire more clearly into the picture here? Um, well, I think we have to understand empire to understand the war in the first place. Wars aren't bugs in imperial systems, but features, right? Wars don't happen out of nowhere, out of the blue, with some random shot in Sarajevo and some archduke wandering around, right? Wars are part of imperial systems. They, they, that, that's the way empires have formed themselves through history, and it was certainly the way the highly militarized and militaristic Russian Empire had formed itself. Um, so treating wars as external to other social and political developments um, is a mistake. The second reason that we have to sort of bring empire in here is that the revolution witnessed not only the end of the dynasty and the end of the political dominance of upper and middle classes, but also the end of a roughly 400-year empire. As we'll see, the evisceration of the imperial state began at the very outset of the war, and the fate of the Russian imperial project as a whole was in doubt well before the abdication of the Tsar. And then finally, when we bring all three of these together, of war, of empire, and revolution, what we can see is that the main effect of the war years, from 14 through, well, really through 18, and then into the Russian Civil War, the main effect was of radicalization. Wars don't have to radicalize, but this one did, in part due to the radical features of this new total form of war, but also because war and revolution occurred in the midst of the imperial crisis that I'll describe now. 
So first, to orient you about the territories I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about and what the Eastern Front looked like in World War I. I'm sure some of you have been to the previous talks and have a sense of what the Eastern Front looked like, but in case uh, you missed those, this is, um, uh, this is a map that can sort of orient you to what's going on on the, east, on the Eastern Front. And you'll notice a couple of things uh, on this map, I hope. The first is that the Europe of 1914 was a continent of empires. <laughs> we've got the German Reich, we've got Austria-Hungary, we've got uh, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, a lot of states that you would see on the map of Europe today are just not on this map because they were not states in 1914. It was a continent, again, uh, largely of empires. The second is, the thing you might notice is how much greater the scale of events in terms of uh, uh, territorial distance were on the Eastern Front as opposed to the Western Front. So um, this large uh, difference, um, uh, even before you see the Brest-Litovsk peace, pushed the Eastern Front well into um, uh, the former territories of the Russian Empire. If you look at the, the relatively constrained territories uh, on, on the Western Front, you can see, still see how much more is happening in the uh, colonial borderlands of Eastern Europe, the territories that are now independent states of Poland, of Ukraine, of Lithuania, of Latvia, of Belarus, right? Those states, they formed the front lines of, uh, of World War I. And it's that territory that I want to think about a little bit more clearly here uh, today. These empires were under threat in 1914, um, not so much from nationalists in the east of this map, in the territories, let's say, of Poland and Ukraine, as in the uh, south of the map. Um, the moves towards decolonization in Europe, towards the end of empire, the threats to empire in Europe, in the 100 years coming up to World War I are happening largely in the Balkans. This is the most successful region in terms of European decolonization. Uh, and I won't spend the time to go through that whole long process over the course of the 19th century here, but it culminates in the years immediately before World War I. In 1912, there's the so-called First Balkan War, which pushes the Ottoman Empire largely off the Balkan Peninsula as a whole. That's done by a Balkan League of, of, of uh, independent um, uh, uh, groupings and eventually independent states in the, in, in the Balkans, and uh, which is rapidly followed in 1913 by a second Balkan war, which is fought between those states for regional hegemony, largely for control of Macedonia. And that's, again, something I can talk about a little bit later. Decolonization doesn't mean just national freedom and everybody draws borders and is happy ever after, right? Decolonization means opening up a new round of conflict because you've opened up the, um, uh, 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 the, the realm for political entrepreneurs, which is a, a topic that I will come back to near the end. So this is where the threats to empire are coming from. Within the Russian Empire, there had been threats to empire in the 1905 revolution. There had been rebellions in the imperial uh, borderlands. Um, there had been very serious rebellions, for instance, in Poland. But the Russian state had survived that revolution, and most Finnish, Polish, Ukrainian nationalists in the years between 1905 and 1914 are convinced they're not going to survive, to, they're not going to live long enough to see freedom for their peoples. Uh, they think they've been defeated. They think correctly that the Russian state is getting stronger in these years. They think they've had whatever chance they might have had and, um, uh, and, and that the future doesn't look bright for national independence in, uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe. So the question arises, um, if it's not nationalist mobilization that challenges empire most strongly here in, uh, at the beginning of the war, what is it that does the most to destroy the Russian imperial state, to reduce autonomy, and to hand power over to nationalists in the borderland? And the answer to that question is, surprisingly, Tsar Nicholas himself, although he doesn't know it. In 1914, one of the first actions that the Tsar takes upon the declaration of war is to declare martial law in the borderlands, especially in the border, uh, and, and these borderlands are not just the territories around the front lines, but they extend deeply into the heart of the Russian Empire itself. All of these shaded, ter these striped territories here are territories that are put under martial law. So this is an enormous chunk of territory, stretching all the way to Pet what will eventually, in a couple of days, be Petrograd. Um, uh, all the way from, from, uh, uh, from Poland uh, to, um, uh, to, to the imperial capital. This is done not to end the Russian Empire, in Nicholas's view, but because he thinks that the military is going to make things more orderly. 
Right? He thinks, okay, martial law means more order. Martial law means more security. Martial law means more reliability. But what he doesn't understand is that he has set in motion a, a set of events that is going to disarticulate the imperial state. There are a couple of aspects to this. The first is that as these armies build in these borderlands, it becomes clear to civilian administrators that their security might be in jeopardy. This happens actually even before the ma major battles. One of the first things that happens even before the big battles in East Prussia in 1914 is the Germans send patrols down the Vistula River and they take a couple of border towns. They go into those border towns, they rustle up the mayor, um, they tell him, okay, uh, you know, we're, we're going to requisition some goods from you, um, we want to make sure that you ensure order, and if things go bad, you're going to be the one that pays. It becomes clear to all these civilian officials that uh, things are not going to be great for them if the Germans come in and occupy this territory. So many of them flee. Take another example. Let's say you're in a customs post on the border and you see the German army massing on the other side over the course of a couple of weeks. You're going to get out of town as quickly as you can, and that's what many of them do, and they flee to Warsaw. So they abandon many of these territories. The army plans on replacing them with uh, uh, an army's civilian administration. They form under general headquarters a civilian administration. That administration is staffed by somewhere between six and 12 people for the first year of the war. This is a territory larger than Germany that they're proposing to govern with a dozen people at the same time that those armies are fighting a two-front war against the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans. It's not going to work. They, they do not have the capacity. They don't know what they're doing. And the traditional civilian administrators have fled. So what happens in these Polish towns on the, border, on the borderlands here in late 1914? Who is it that regulates markets? Who is it that puts together fire brigades? Who is it that tries to provide security to these residents? Well. It's local notables, and those local notables are largely Polish nationalists. The same people that have been pushing for autonomy for these Polish areas ever since the partitions of Poland are now handed power without the Tsar basically even knowing. So that's one thing that's happening in these borderlands, is the disarticulation of the imperial state. This extends to the economy, too. The economy prior to the war is a very international and global economy. There's large-scale labor migration, largely of folks from the Russian Empire to the German Empire. There's a vibrant exchange. There's a lot of trade, international trade going through these regions. And this is a multi-ethnic space in which these ethnicities tend to occupy um, uh, 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 ethnicized um, jobs in the economy. Jews in this territory are largely forbidden from owning land. Um, this is the, uh, the, the edict in any case. Most edicts you can get around in various ways. But it's largely true that Jews are not engaged in agriculture here. They're, they're engaged in small urban professions, largely, in, in small towns throughout the, the, the Pale Settlement. Germans tend to be overrepresented among the nobility and among the owners of large manufacturing concerns. Slavs tend to be peasants. And so you have an ethnicized economy in this multi-ethnic space. So when the army does what it does in the beginning of the war and adopt ethnopolitics as a governing strategy and say, we're going to treat Germans as enemies, we're going to treat Jews as enemies, and starts deporting them and arresting them and putting them under suspicion, big sectors of the economy are being pulled out, like Jenga blocks out of this imperial economy. So the state is sort of um, evaporating. The economy is having these building blocks pulled out of it, and the economic policies they try to deal with this just make matters worse. For instance, in order to deal with inflation, uh, they decide they're going to institute price controls. Price controls don't work to control inflation, and so what happens is a huge black market springs up. So all of these things are bubbling up in these borderlands in 1914 and 1915 that are crippling the imperial state, and also some of these processes are starting to lead back into the center of the country. And this really is when uh, the imperial state um, begins to fail. When you add on to this, of course, there are massive um, uh, battles happening in this region, a lot of physical destruction. You can see that, um, that the situation is, is even more dire, actually, than many of the critics of the government uh, uh, back in central Russia um, are realizing here uh, as, um, as, 19, as the spring of 1915 um, um, arrives. The biggest moment, though, for the disarticulation of the empire and, therefore, also for the radicalization of the war 
happens as a result of military defeat in 1915. This is one of the most, probably the most dramatic military um, victory in the war on the part of the Central Powers. The Russians are actually planning in the spring of 1915 to try to win the war themselves. They've fought very brutal battles over the winter of 1914-15 to get to the peaks of the Carpathian Mountains. They're planning on going downhill in the spring onto the Hungarian plain to take Budapest and hopefully knock the Austro-Hungarians out of the war and force the Germans to sue for peace. In order to forestall that, the Germans and the Austrians uh, launch an attack in the foothills of the Carpathians uh, here between Garlitsa and Tarnov, um, and attack the Russian Third Army in April and May of 1915. And in contrast to many of the battles of the war, in which um, uh, initial success is foiled by the rapid deployment of reserves, um, the Russians mismanage reserves and mismanage their artillery reserves in these battles. They launch a faithful counterattack with much of the rest of the Third Army that ends up with it being destroyed, many of the men being taken prisoner or dying. And this huge hole is punched in the Russian lines that the forces of the Central Powers go through. This forces a retreat um, from the peaks of the Carpathians here without, a, without battles. They basically retreat before they're encircled. A similar move later in the summer in the, uh, uh, on the northern part of the front, on the Narev River, accomplishes a similar thing. And so in the course of 1915, the Germans are now trying to beat the Russians by encircling almost all of the Russian armies in this great Polish pocket, forcing surrender, and again, hopefully knocking the Russians out of the war. Um, the Russians instead uh, beat a organized, if, um, uh, if destructive, retreat, and they're able to save all of their armies. They escape out of this pocket at the cost of losing all of Poland, basically. So they, they reform, and you can see this straight line on the right of the map here, they reform this line um, and, and give up Poland and much of their victories in, in Ukraine from the, from the previous year. So even though the Russian army lives to fight another day, which it does, um, this is plainly a massive, massive defeat for, um, uh, for uh, not only for the military, but also for the political leadership. And so what it prompts is an intense period of crisis in the country in the summer, of summer and fall of 1915. Um, strikes begin. There had been very few strikes in between the declaration of war and the summer of 1915. Radical labor movements now pick up the pace again. Workers begin to organize again in ways that they had done prior to the war. Ethnic pogroms happen in the center of Russia, um, especially in the city of Moscow, when news of one of the most painful defeats, um, uh, the retaking of the fortress of Przemysl, um, leads to anti-German pogroms, which ends up basically destroying half of the foreign-held uh, companies in the, in, in, the, in the city of Moscow by, by the end of the day. And finally, it leads to a political crisis. Virtually everyone in the, in the Russian political spectrum, from the moderate right <clears throat> to the moderate left, joins in what's called the progressive bloc. And the goals of this bloc is basically to, to use the public forces of the country to support the war effort and to support the autocracy. This would mean an end to autocracy, which Nicholas understands. This would mean some sort of power sharing arrangement with the public, even greater and he had, had been, been forced to, um, to countenance in 1905 uh, in, in the midst of that revolution. But it seems clear to everyone that the state is, that the government is mismanaging the war and that something has to be done about it. Um, that process ends not with a power sharing agreement, but with Nicholas stubbornly insisting that he alone was going to run the country, taking personal command of the armed forces, disbanding the Russian parliament, and telling everybody else basically to go home. Um, this was a phenomenal, uh, a critical mistake in the midst of the war, uh, and, and one that fatally, um, uh, fatally crippled the autocracy uh, and, and would lead um, eventually to its demise um, uh, about a year and a half later. There's also an enormous social crisis that's going on as a result of these um, uh, retreats most pa painfully felt in the scale of the refugee crisis. About three million uh, citizens from the western borderlands 
are forced to flee in the course of 1915 alone, about six million over the course of the war as a whole. These folks largely congregate near where they're fled. Um, they don't travel uh, more than they need to. But over the course of the war, they spread across all of Russia, into central Russia as far as the Pacific coast. So refugees become a daily part of life. And, and they signal physically the incompetence of the government and the crisis with which, in which the state and the empire were living. And so all of these phenomena over the course of 1915 increase, um, and, and all of them tied up right, with imperial questions too. All of these, almost all of these refugees are, are not ethnic Russians. All of these events are, are, are leading to a political crisis, but also social, political, uh, and, and violent, in many cases, radicalization. So this process, again, begins long before 1917. It does, however, um, culminate in 1917 um, with the familiar events of, of the Russian Revolution. The economic and political crises that I described developing over the course of the war hit certain groups more, hit certain groups harder than others. And this is true all across Europe. And one of the most um, vulnerable groups in wartime Europe was that of urban women uh, who were uh, sort of on the, uh, on the cusp of, of protest and resistance in many European cities, in Berlin, in Vienna um, uh, especially, uh, but who revolt first in Petrograd on International Women's Day in 1917 when uh, uh, they launch a couple of different marches, actually some in the working class district of town, headed by working women, some in the middle class, um, uh, Nevsky Prospekt, uh, uh, headed by um, uh, better to do women, but all of them denouncing the war and denouncing the Tsarist government. These women are quickly joined by hundreds of thousands of other protesters, other workers, male and female, from across the capital, and eventually by um, mutinous um, uh, uh, units of soldiers as well, who are the ones who turn the tide uh, in the midst of the February Revolution and uh, uh, take control of the city of Petrograd. The Tsar, Nicholas, decides he's going to drown the revolution in blood. He gets on a train, orders troops to be sent from the front line to Petrograd to retake the city from the revolutionaries. And his train is put on a siding by his top high command, uh, who persuade him that, um, that this would be catastrophic for Russia, it would be catastrophic for the war effort, and that instead he had to abdicate. And he accepts their judgment, uh, and he abdicates, ending the 300-year uh, reign of the Romanov dynasty. But the abdication of Nicholas doesn't end this problem of radicalization. Um, it doesn't end the problem that conducting a war and a revolution at the same time is extremely difficult. And it certainly doesn't end any of the imperial problems that I've been talking about as well. And indeed, all of these move together over the course of 1917. Most famously, one of the first crises that faces the new temporary or provisional government in 1917 has to do with the war aims of Russia itself. Um, in April, uh, it, it, it comes out that the foreign minister, one of the leading oppositionists prior to the revolution, um, the leader of the liberal constitutional democratic party, uh, the, foreign, the new foreign minister, Pavel Milyukov, um, has quietly told his, uh, his, his, uh, his allies that Russia is still, still in the war and still expects to get things, um, especially control over the straits, if uh, the Entente um, uh, proves successful at the end of the day in World War II. Um, this is immediately rejected by leaders in the Petrograd Soviet, by soldiers, and by many others on the streets of Petrograd. Not so much, actually barely at all, that Milyukov is a liberal or that he's bourgeois. The problem is that Milyukov remains an imperialist. The problem is that Milyukov wants to continue this war for imperial gains. He's forced into a position where he says, okay, we're gonna, we, might have to, uh, we might have to renounce some of these Russian goals, um, but we're going to stay in the war. That's not a solution either. If you stay in the war and renounce Russian gains, then you're fighting for British French imperialism, and that's much worse than fighting for everybody else's imperialism, right? So, so basically, what is being forced here, and this is very concretely expressed by soldiers in their committees and through their, many of their leaders in the Petrograd Soviet, is that they want to see um, uh, the war coming to an end, 
not through um, uh, surrender to the Germans, but on the basis of a peace without annexations or indemnities. That is to say, going back to the status quo antebellum. They want to, to say we are not any longer going to fight a war for empire, but we're willing to fight a defensive war. And that becomes the, um, uh, the widespread agreement among military troops in the spring of, of 1917. And it costs Milyukov his job. It costs the Minister of War Alexander Guchkov his job, and eventually leads to a reshuffling of the cabinet itself. This continues throughout the summer of 1917. I won't go into all of these, uh, all of these um, details, but <clears throat> in virtually every moment in 1917, these, these questions of war and revolution and empire are all wrapped up with one another, and the pattern, the rolling ball over the course of 1917, is one of greater and greater radicalization. And it's that radicalization that is eventually going to open the door for the most extreme left-wing party in Russia, the Bolshevik party, Lenin's party, um, to take power in October. The provisional government has become so discredited by continuing to fight a war, by continuing to fight in many respects for empire, that a movement that promises famously peace, land, and bread, but also promises an anti-imperial platform, the Bolsheviks are always the most consistent anti-imperialists in 1917, um, is one that is enormously attractive to key sectors within um, the Russian political um, 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 firmament, most notably urban workers and soldiers. Right? That's who uh, is especially impressed by, um, by this, um, uh, by this uh, uh, um, um, program. It also connects, of course, with this question of insurrection that I talked about before. Uh, the Bolsheviks are also distinguished not only by their political platform, but by, by their political tactics. And that, um, uh, that is another thing which allows them to have, to quite easily um, take power in October of 1917. It was quite easy for them to take Petrograd. It was enormously difficult for them to establish that control over the rest of the Russian state. Indeed, the, what happens over the course of the first few months after the October Revolution is an intensification of decolonization. Lenin and the other top Bolsheviks agree to let Finland become independent over the New Year's holiday between 1917 and 1918. In the midst of the brest peace talks, uh, Ukraine finally, uh, the Ukrainian Rada, declares independence. And because Trotsky has been at those talks, been pounding the desk uh, uh, with the slogan of national self-determination, he finds himself unable to argue against Ukrainian independence very effectively in the midst of those meetings. And Ukraine, too, um, establishes a brief period of uh, 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 of independence. But more to the point, the Bolsheviks in the capital simply lose control of the country as a whole. Uh, this map shows the extent of Bolshevik control of the country in 1918, in the summer of 1918, in August, after they lose the city of Kazan, where the um, Russian Empire, in many respects, uh, had its uh, sort of inaugural moment under Ivan the Terrible in the middle of the 16th century. Uh, it is now, it now no longer holds even Kazan in uh, August of 1918. This is full-on decolonization. All of the imperial borderlands are gone. It's also full-on state collapse. And so this um, is sort of the nadir of, of, of Russian imperial power in the 20th century. And it, and it, has come, it, it is the culmination of all of these radicalizing um, um, processes. And so what we see here, the culmination of this radicalization, the culmination of this state failure, is a period of warlordism. We can really best understand the Russian Civil War in many respects as, as a warlord period in which many different um, military leaders um, establish control over relatively limited territories. Um, this uh, system of warlordism is, of course, enormously unstable. Warlords aren't great for your local economy. <laughs> Warlords aren't great for your, for your personal security. Given the chance, most people don't want to live under warlords. But more to the point, Warlordism had been defeated around the world when it is defeated by larger scale, bureaucratized, regular armies. And that was what um, the, the Soviets initially um, struggled to build, but by 1919 had done a much more effective job of doing. And by 1919 and into 1920, the fact that they're able to build this bureaucratized, uh, regular military 
began to turn the tide of the Russian Civil War. There's a little bit of an irony here, right? Um, that the communists who come to power supposedly saying that the state is going to wither away, that the state is simply the reflection of class interests, that the state is simply the reflection of, 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 of organizing violence within a society, it turns out that the secret weapon of the Bolsheviks was that they were better state builders than all these other people who were much more pro-state at the beginning of the war, these white leaders um, uh, that, uh, that led these other forces over the course of the, um, of the Civil War. And I think one of the best ways to understand that is that all of these warlords, and again, there were dozens of them, there was only one of them who envisioned his post-war career not being a military guy in control of territory and resources, but the commissar of heavy industry. And that only warlord that envisioned that was, of course, Trotsky. Right? The ambition of the Soviet warlords, in the, of the Bolshevik warlords in the Civil War, was to build a revolutionary state. So as we move on and think about the legacy then of this revolution, as we sort of wrap up our thinking of the way that we might understand this connection between war and revolution and what it means for the hundred years afterwards. We have to take seriously this question of building communism and building states uh, as something that is central and crucial to the revolutionary project, even if it was sometimes a little bit embarrassing <laughs> for the Bolsheviks um, who were actually conducting uh, this, this, this state building. This was it could remain a heroic project for them, and it did remain a heroic project for them in many respects. It was also a terrible project for millions of people living within the Soviet Union. The creation of this strong state, or stronger state, uh, meant that this increase in state capacity could also bring an increase in state repression. Now, there's... Um, uh, I think it's certainly true, as many scholars have said, that the, uh, in, in the words of, uh, uh, of my colleague Mark Adela, that, that the Soviet state was a limping behemoth. That is to say, it was huge and could be destructive, but it was also flawed and lacked capacity in a lot of ways. And I, and I would agree with that. And I would agree with that characterization of many post-colonial states, by the way. But this building of, uh, of the state and, the co and, and communism together as being part of this revolutionary fervor is part of what marks um, the Soviet project really for uh, the period from the end of the Civil War in 1921 until the end of the Soviet Union um, in 1991. Uh, this is the uh, uh, magazine cover of, of, a, of a journal, sort of Technology for Youth, in, in 1958 with a Komsomol member on watch uh, before the opening of one of their um, Komsomol congresses. And it captures this um, uh, highly stylized sort of uh, energy and enthusiasm for the communist project, certainly here in the mid-1950s. So finally, there's the question of legacies, right? Um, what is the legacy of the Russian Revolution today? That heroic Marxist figure in the last slide, he's not around anymore, right? That's, that's, not, what we're, that's not what we're seeing. So are there legacies today? Um, this is a picture of, of Tahrir Square, right? Um, people are still struggling with figuring out how to create social change, how to um, create systems of greater social or economic justice. And they're wondering what the Bolshevik legacy might mean. Because the result of the disciplined, centralized, hierarchical Bolshevik party succeeding in revolution by building an, uh, a relatively effective um, state, uh, is not perhaps the favorite outcome of many people that, <laughs> uh, that are pushing for the goals of greater uh, justice and equality in the world today. Um, but it was probably the most successful of those efforts over the last 100 years. If you think about sort of long-term change within a particular country, within a particular society, and for its global influence. And so this, this struggle between um, uh, broader, let's say, more democratic forms of political and economic organizing 
uh, and the um, sometimes tepid results that that organizing brings compared to the much more highly organized but also potentially quite dictatorial and brutal forms that the Bolsheviks developed over the course of the 20th century is still something that hangs over political protest and social thought today. So that's all I have. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. This is an important question, right? Like what, um, for later revolutionary movements that themselves claim to be communist, or at least leftist, you know, um, what does this model of, of, of Bolshevik uh, revolution, what sort of model or influence or legacy do they have? And I think it's a tremendous legacy, absolutely. I mean, I think if you look at the way that insurrectionary, let me take a step back. The Russian revolutionary movement, even before the success of the revolution, um, had developed a certain form of revolutionary organization, of insurrectionary organization. That was not new in revolutionary history, uh, but that they deployed um, extremely effectively as they moved, as they considered the problem of being radicals, of being illegal radicals in a state that wanted to repress them. Um, having smaller cellular groups that are headed by, uh, uh, <laughs> that, um, uh, that are headed by, again, by a hierarchical organization. Um, this allowed the Bolshevik party um, to, uh, to take power as a minority po party um, and to um, overcome the repression that, that, that the state um, uh, imposed upon them. And this happens in, in other places as well. Insurrectionary movements take some of the spirit of the Bolsheviks, they take some of the organizing of the Bolsheviks, even if they eventually also struggle with the Soviet Union once they achieve power. We can think of this certainly in China. We can think of this certainly in Cuba. Uh, uh, we can think of this in, in uh, it's, it's more difficult when we think about the sort of the post-war Soviet bloc states, right? Those were, there were native communist parties in those regions that had um, influence and, and authority after the end of the war, but Stalin purged many of those and replaced them with people loyal to himself. And so, Absolutely, the Bolshevik model and the Bolshevik experience is one that, um, that other revolutionary parties adopt and, and lead to the creation of communist states, of course, some of which are still, still around today. So yeah, I, th I think that's a lasting legacy. Certainly one of the goals that the Bolsheviks have, and this is, I mean, not only the early Bolsheviks, but, but, but one of the key goals of Stalinism, is an attempt to answer this question. If you proclaim yourself hostile to the global capitalist system, how can you survive as an economy? Um, and how can you modernize, by which they mean industrialize, and modernize is, is, is their term, and industrialize, develop. Uh, this was certainly one of the key goals that, 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 that Stalin had as well. And this is another of the Bolshevik models, right? Um, how do you achieve uh, a rapid industrialization without full access to global capitalist markets, right? This is something that Stalin does achieve um, at great cost over the course of the first five-year plan. And that is a model that is discussed um, and uh, becomes an option for states that decolonize in the post-World War II era in Africa and in Asia, right? And so the Soviet model is there for the taking, not just because of the Cold War conflict, which invites bidding by Cold War powers, right, to, to, to provide aid or other sorts of development projects, but also because it requires contemplation of what sort of model, um, um, what sort of entry into the global economy a new, a new state might take. So there's that question of development, but there's all, there is also this question of the state. I, I hinted before that, uh, well I didn't hint, I had on the slide that I'm seeing the Soviet Union in the 1920s as a post-colonial state. That is to say, it's a state, fundamental to this understanding is that when you have decolonization, one state ends and a new state begins. You can't just like put new nameplates on the office and say, oh, everything's gonna work the same way it did before. I'm now the Minister of Finance. I'm now gonna run this government. Because states aren't just office tags. They are systems of authority and domination and of networks of individuals and favors that are owed and money, right? I mean, there's all sorts of things that are going into this state building, um, uh, state building project. And so, if you're going to have this end of empire and rebirth of something, a new multi-ethnic state, you have to rebuild all of those things. And the, the weaknesses of that development mean both that uh, citizens suffer in certain ways, there's a lower standard of living, there's higher degrees of poverty, but it also opens the door for greater violence because the state 
in order to achieve its goals, sometimes feels like it has to um, uh, engage in, in, in more violent practices. This is going to vary from decolonizing state to decolonizing state. Um, uh, certainly, you know, Ghana and Kenya um, are examples of, you know, in many respects, relatively successful decolonizing states. But one can also look, let's say, at Congo or Somalia, places that are, are riven more by, um, by, by civil war and longer periods of civil conflict, which are in part driven by this, this larger post-colonial problem of poverty and violence and, um, and a fractured political system. I know, that's probably a long-winded answer to your question, but that's... <laughs> I think you may have already hit on this, but it seems to me that uh that uh, the Bolsheviks succeeded not because they were strong, successful state builders, but because they weren't as weak as the people who were opposing them. And that ultimately, as you just probably suggested, that they had to depend upon terror in order to make whatever success they had. And, and uh, so, so they, they really were not successful state builders, and it was not a viable model at all, although they, of course, pretended it was. Yeah, you know, um, there's a couple of really important questions there, right? One is whether terror was necessary um, for the Soviet state to develop in the way that it did, or even for Stalinism to develop in the way it did, and I'd be, be happy to, to talk about that. The question, other question is whether this state um, was viable, and this is something one hears a lot, that, you know, that communism is an impossible system, right? That um, it can't possibly work. It did work for a long period of time, right? I mean, it was there for 75 years. It did emerge victorious in World War II. Um, that was a very serious test of state and military capacity. <laughs> the Nazi invasion was a very serious test of the ability of the Stalinist regime to build a functioning um, uh, military and, and, and state apparatus. So that, um, I'm not sure I would agree that it was um, 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 in principle unviable. Now this question of whether terror was necessary, um, I think is also an interesting question. But in certain ways, it's, it's, it's going to too far down a counterfactual road. Um, Stalin was uh, a brutal, violent, conspiratorial, uh, often paranoid individual um, who believed that violence, in many cases, was the best option when presented with a variety of options. So Stalinism was likely to be um, violent as a result. Now, Stalin and Stalinism are not the same thing. There are millions of people involved in, in, in sort of everyday Stalinism on, on, on a daily level. But Stalin's decisions did matter. And, and the fact that you had a, um, an extremely vi violent and tyrannical individual at the head of the state meant that these sorts of terror campaigns were, were much more likely. And obviously, they were certainly possible, even plausible, within the Soviet system. Um, so I, I tend not to go too far down the road of alternatives, let's say, to, to Stalin. Um, but I'm also not sure that that means that, um, that the sort of terror one sees in the collectivization campaign and again in 1937, and then again in the post-war period, that those were absolutely necessary for some of the other things I was talking about. With regard to legacies, I, given what's happening in Russia today, where does Vladimir Putin uh, come in as far as his, his role in, in the legacy today? No, this is, this, this is an important question because even though Putin, as I said at the beginning of the talk, is not much inclined to celebrate the Russian Revolution today, uh, Putin is, is not, does not want to see revolution. <laughs> He's in power, right? A, new, a Russian Revolution in Russia today is bad news for Putin, so he doesn't want to like, encourage revolutionary thoughts in this way. But Putin is definitely inheriting a legacy in which these questions of state power and stability are extremely important. Um, one of the promises of the post-Stalin Soviet Union was to provide this sort of stability, was to, was to tell people these terrible days of famine, of civil war, of disease, of political terror, of foreign invasion, those days are over. We now have a new Soviet system. It, we're going to continue to work at it. It may not be perfect, but you're going to have an apartment, you're going to have bread, you're going to have 
the list of things that the, that the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s provided to its citizens. And the main thing it provided was stability and not thinking that you were going to be killed in some nasty fashion in the next week or two, right? The 90s overturned that in a certain way for many people in Russia. It, it introduces this notion of chaos, of political chaos, and of deep, de of deep economic depression, right? I mean, Russia suffers an economic depression in the 90s that's worse than the, than the United States has in the 1930s. So it's a massive shock to the system. And the public sort of culture of power is one of disorder and chaos. Yeltsin's public figure, sort of famously, in, sort of in character of like a drunken buffoon, was, was felt deeply by many Russians as, as representing not only sort of Russia's weakness on a world stage, but of disorder, and, and, and that this was, was not likely to, um, uh, to be sustainable. And so Putin's image within the Russian political system of being someone who is orderly, who is firm, who is sober, who is organized, um, and who does see economic growth over the first couple of terms of his presidency in the early aughts. Um, this accounts for much of, I think, and many, and many others do too, this accounts for a lot of Putin's popularity, but it has to do with this recurring fear of state failure and what that might bring. And so what Putin provides is that is a certain sort of um, hope for, for long-term stability, even at the cost of, of potential um, brands of authoritarianism sort of emerging within Russia. Warlordism, just to take a step back and talk about, because I sort of breezed over that in the talk about what I mean by this. So what happens, is, as you know, over the course of the Russian Civil War, um, is that power fractures and that, if you have an image of sort of red armies fighting white armies, that's, that's not what's happening between 1918 and 1921. There's not a lot of communication, let's say, about, among anti-Bolshevik forces in the south of Russia and those that are operating in Mongolia and those that are operating in Estonia. Those are all, all operating um, on, their own, um, on their own terms, really. Uh, and they have some coordination, but, but very little. And above all, what they are doing is they're organizing um, uh, uh, authority and resources in those territories through the use of military force. So there are, a warlord is someone who's asserting political authority on the basis of their sort of direct military capacity in a, in a, in a given moment. And again, this is not an unfamiliar, uh, this is not an unfamiliar um, historical phenomenon or you know, think of like Game of Thrones, right? I mean, this is like, this is, this is what you're doing. Your, your fighting capacity is, is what's gonna sort of, is what's gonna bring you your authority and bring you your, your, your legitimacy. So going back to Tilly and these other sort of mm, historical sociologists and those who think about the military revolution in the early modern period, what the bureaucratized state allows uh, to happen is for greater resources to be poured into um, uh, units that would fight warlords, right? So warlords are able to terrorize and, and, and hold power over small amounts of territory, but when they try to get too big, they don't have their own political capacity to extend this over large territories. And Kornilov um, finds this out in 1917. Uh, Denikin finds it out in certain ways. He tries to move into, into Sochi and, and, there, and these, un, you know, sort of the, the Russia won an indivisible slogan sort of trips him up there. And what the Bolsheviks are able to do over the course, especially of 1919, is to build this bureaucracy, especially, and this goes back to my first book, especially to recruit and retain soldiers in the Red Army in 1919 by offering payments to their families, welfare payments to their families. What do you need to, or, to give welfare pay, payments to a family? Well, you need money. You need officials in a local territory. You need civilians to be helping to do that. You need draft lists. You need people sitting in offices, writing their names down. A whole set of things that warlords aren't that good at usually. And so the Red Army grows exponentially over the course of 1919 through these practices and by capturing and by defeating and capturing other white units that then turn to them. And so it's sort of a classic tale of, of leveraging this bureaucratic power over the um, ineffective bureaucratic power of these, of, of these warlords. So it's, it's kind of a classic tale of a state defeating warlords here. Um, and, and my point by showing Trotsky up there was just to say that we shouldn't really be that surprised because Trotsky was thinking at this level that, these, that Ungern Sternberg is not, for instance. Yes, uh, my question is a little bit uh, convoluted maybe, but it... My answer will be two, so that's fine. <laughs> it, 
Its starting point is uh, when you mentioned the idea of what are the legacies of the whole Bolshevik uh, experience. And um, we used to poo-poo the notion that was a organic part of Marxism-Leninism in the Soviet Union, that they were going to create a new Soviet man or a new Soviet person, right? Changing human nature. Um, but some of the people who are writing now about the uh, legacy of communism in Russia are suggesting that there may have been some positive things that survived all of the, the uh, overturnings of the last 25 or 30 years and so on. And the last <laughs> prelude to my question is that one of my oldest and closest and best friends, best friends is, is uh, an East German. And he and his friends, who are very highly educated, uh, sophisticated people, still insist today that there is a difference in the mentality and in the social type between people f who were born and raised in Eastern Germany and those in Western Germany. So, uh, you know, when we, I studied genetics and science way back when I was an undergraduate, and we were told that the inheritance of acquired characteristics is poo, is poo poo, <laughs> Lamarckian genetics, and so on. But do you personally think, because you obviously have a lot of contact with people now who live in Russia, et cetera, that there, there may have been some sort of permanent changes in the psychology of, of uh, of the Russian and, and formerly Soviet people that are not necessarily negative and c which could conceivably, despite Stalin's repressions and all that, be attributed to the Bolshevik experiment? <laughs> yeah, um, so the short answer is if you insist on the word permanent, then no. Um, I don't think we can think about permanent changes in that way. I don't think there's any sort of genetic basis. So you've plainly know more about genetics than I do, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that genetic changes are not the place to look for this. But is it true that there's a different mentality among people that grew up in East Germany, West Germany, I think is obviously true. Um, and this again is a legacy of the Bolsheviks that, that one can see if, if one travels throughout the former second world. Um, that was a world, if you fly over many different former cities of the second world, you see very similar things, very similar apartment buildings, very similar town squares. The urban space is similar. Um, because of attempts at sort of regularizing certain aspects of the Soviet experience, whether that was in East Germany or, you know, or in Bulgaria or in you know, the former Soviet Union, <coughs> education systems, notions about what culture meant, um, uh, what constituted great literature, like a series of things that we can think about as culture, the things that we grow up with, and that condition our lives from that point forward, those were definitely, there was definitely a different modality there, right? Um, it's not to say there were no differences between, you know, sort of Sofia and Moscow. Of course there were, in the same way that there are differences um, between, you know, Paris and New York. But we could see a lot of commonalities between Paris and New York, and we could see a lot of commonalities. There was a first world, there was a second world, right? And that, um, and so I think it's absolutely, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree completely that, that folks that lived in that second world have a different outlook on their social, cultural, and political lives. Now, how far that extends into the future, now that there have been tremendous changes, those apartment buildings, most of them are still there. Moscow has a plan to take most of them down now. we are running into a lot of um, uh, resistance from the people living in those apartments. As all of this changes in certain respects over time, um, it will be interesting to see how far those, those legacies persist. So I don't think it will be permanent, but it's definitely still here. <coughs> Last question, please. Hi, Hi again. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you personally if you consider the Soviet Union to be an empire, and if so, when does it become an empire? And then um, in the context of decol decolonization in war and revolution, how do you, where is that in conversation with the popularity of post-colonialist approaches today for post-Soviet and post-Soviet states after the breakup of the USSR socialism? Yeah, no, this is a great set of questions. Um, thank you. Um, so one of the things, one of the reasons scholars, so scholars don't usually talk about this period in terms of decolonization in Europe. Um, and one of the reasons that they didn't do it 
was that the Bolsheviks quickly recreated most of the old um, Tsarist Empire. Not all of it, not Poland, not Finland, not the Baltic states until World War II, uh, right? So there's a period in which some of these territories are not, are not reacquired. And it looked like the rebuilding of the Russian Empire, as if the Russian Empire had never left. And so many outside observers say, well, the empire never went away. So one of the points of the talk today was to say the empire was gone in the middle of 1918, which means that it had to be rebuilt. That is a much longer story, of course. Um, it would take another 45 minutes at least to, to talk about what that process of rebuilding those networks of authority were. But they were on much different bases than, than the Tsarist Empire had been. So do they still fit within the concept of empire? A, a very common definition for empire, one that I use, and I know other, other folks in, in the field use from, from Michael Doyle, is an empire is basically um, um, a, a, a large-scale political system in, in which there's political, um, a political hierarchy, political dominance of one political community towards another. That is to say there's, a, there's a, a dominating and a dominated. Does that make them colonizer and colonized? Not always. Not always, um, but I think within that context, uh, the Soviet Union was an empire. It was a curious kind of empire, um, especially in the first you know, 20 years in which there was a very concerted effort made to, to develop indigenous elites um, for a series of, of very important reasons for the state. Uh, it was also a curious empire really in many respects up until the end of the Soviet Union in that it um, uh, it consciously uh, spent more money in the colonies than it extracted. Many empires are not winning economic bets, but usually they're trying to be <laughs> winning economic bets, and the Soviets didn't always try. So it was an unusual kind of empire, but it was organized around an ethnic basis. Uh, Russians, especially by the mid-30s and then to the end, were seen as the elder brother, at least, and, and, and there was political domination, of course. So it was a curious kind of empire, but, but I think it was an empire. And that's why I think you see many of the folks that are talking about the post-91 period thinking about this as, as a post-colonial period. And so I think it makes a lot of sense, and I agree with those folks that you should look at the post-Soviet world as part of, through these sort of post-colonial lenses um, in the same way that I think we should also look at the 20s in that way in ways that I think are not as, as fully developed. So I hope that, hope that answers your question. Thank you very much.